begin with a, just a little bit about my doctoral project, and then we can go on to questions about Islam if people want to have questions about Islam. So, my doctoral project uh, is entitled Russian Orthodox Clergy Attitudes Towards Practitioners of Other Religions, Implications for Orthodox Clerical Formation in the 21st Century. So, that doesn't mean much, probably, to most people, um, and that's okay. That's, those things are supposed to sound like that, you know, to mean everything and nothing. But the crux of the, of the proposal of the project is basically that there's a perception in Russia that the clergy have inappropriate attitudes, some of the clergy have inappropriate attitudes towards people of other religions. And this is kind of a hard thing. What is inappropriate attitude towards someone of another religion? Because we, as Orthodox Christians, make a claim that we are the true church, right? So that, very, that means that those who are not part of the true church are, are outside of a place of salvation. Well, maybe that means that. We can talk about that. But certainly it means that they're in a not very enviable position vis-a-vis -vis salvation. But does that mean, therefore, that we hate those people? See, this is a really important question because uh, Christ said, go out and teach all nations and baptize them. But he also said that we should love those who hate us and pray for those who despitefully use us. And that people will know you are my disciples because you have love one for another. Well, love is a pretty important message of Christ. So can we have love on one hand and hate on the other? And so... I would argue that you can't, but at the same time, it's beholden upon us as Orthodox Christians to maintain our faith, to say, this is the true faith and this is why. And so it, it's, not a, it's not a clear question, it's not an easy question, and it's a question that is really open to demagoguery and it's a question that can really lead people to extremes. Right? So, we have legitimate differences with Islam. Therefore, do we hate Muslims? Is hate even something that's possible for us as, as Christians? And I would argue that it's not. Uh, but we still have a legitimate differences with Islam and Judaism. And for that matter, even other forms of Christianity. But can we, or should we, or how can we, have a difference of opinion about a faith and then deal with the people of that faith. Like, how can we discern between them? And I, I would argue, this is not, I'm getting a little off the base of, from my project, but I would argue that as, as Christians, we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to be tolerant of other people, even if we disagree with the way that they believe. Completely. That it's, it's totally inappropriate for us as Orthodox Christians to hate anyone. We can totally disagree with them, but we still have to love them. And I, I think that's really what Christ taught. So, how are we going to get to the answer of this question? Do clergy have inappropriate attitudes towards people of other religions? So, this was actually the hardest part. Like, this has to be a project where you gather data. You know, I couldn't just philosophize about this for 150 pages and pick up my doctorate at the end of the, you know, of that. I had to. We really have to collect data. We have to be able to have some way to show whether this is a problem or not. So this is a problem, I would argue, that needs... The first thing you would think of, well, it should be a quantitative analysis. You need to survey a thousand priests and see if you can discern some kind of trend. I agree with that, and that's what I proposed. And I was told very kindly that that's not going to happen, and so I better think of something else. And so... In working with my advisors, what we decided we would do is start small, see if we could see anything in the small gathering of data, and then, if so, then maybe we can turn this into something bigger later on. So it turns into, from what I thought would be a nice quantitative study, to a qualitative study. We're going to interview 15 to 20 priests uh, in, a, in an American diocese here, and also in one of the Russian dioceses. And I'm not being coy by not saying which one, because I don't know. I thought we were going to go to Kazan. That's why I put all my eggs in the Kazan basket. I did a lot of study of Islam. I was ready to go. 
figured out how I'm going to take the train from Moscow to Kazan, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And so now I'm kind of up in the air. But, you know, that's part of the fun of this. We will figure it out with God's help one way or another where we'll go. You know, um, maybe Kamchatka, maybe, I don't know, Arkhangelsk, somewhere, you know, very foreboding probably. But in any case, it doesn't matter because none of the dioceses will be named, none of the priests will be named. But we're hoping by gathering through interviews of 15 to 20 priests in Russia and 15 to 20 priests here somewhere in America, that we would be able to see something, that there would be some kind of kernel, some kind of grain or something that would lead us to the next step. So that's, that's what we're doing, and my collaborator, uh, her name is Joanna Kormina, she will be with us this week, and in fact she's going to give the talk on Sunday. Um, she's going to talk about the contemporary veneration of St. Senia, because that's one of the things that she studies, she's an anthropologist in St. Petersburg. She's a friend of, uh, of, uh, of Edward Panarin. For those of you who have been around here a long, long time, you remember Ed and his family. They were, they were here, gosh, in the 90s, uh, maybe even the late 80s. And he was getting his PhD in sociology at the University of Michigan. And when I made my proposal, I talked to Ed first. And I said, you know, like, I want to compare data from Russian clergy and in Russia and Russian clergy outside Russia. You know, but I need help. I, I can't do that alone. I don't, I don't, my Russian is rudimentary at best, and it would sound really funny if I was there trying to interview these priests. It just would, there would be way too many confounding variables just in me alone. And so um, he first suggested someone else. That person didn't work out. Then he suggested Jana, and, it, and it's working out really wonderfully. And so anyway, you're going to get a chance to meet her on the weekend. We're going to interview the priests. Uh, and we're going to ask them about how they teach their parishioners about people of other religions. First about other religions, but then about the people of those other religions. And we hope by doing that, something will come out to let us know kind of what, what they're thinking. Because if you sit down with somebody and you say, okay, thank you for coming today, are you a bigot? You're going to have a lot, you're not going to get the kind of feedback that you would like to get. Uh, if you would, on the other hand, have just a discussion about education. We don't know if that's true, but there's a perception that that's true. And we want to get to the core of that. Is there any truth to that perception? And I'm not taking into this any preconceived notion, per se, that yes, it is true. I want to know whether it is. And we're hoping that this is going to help us to, to do that. Also, one of the things that has worked out nicely about this project this will be the first academic project ever comparing uh, clergy abroad and clergy in Russia. And this, is the, this year is the fifth anniversary of the reconciliation between the two churches, and so that kind of works nicely also. I think one of the reasons I went down the road of this project is because at first, whenever you do something like this, when you have this reconciliation, on the surface, it's going to probably be pretty shallow. You know, people won't really know each other. We know that we want to be together, but we don't really know each other. And I would say that it's a, a good metaphor of that is marriage. We know that we want to be together with our spouse, but it's going to take a few years before you really get to know each other, even if you have a long engagement. And so this, I think, is just another step in the reconciliation, which I hope will help to strengthen it, because we'll better understand each other if we understand each other's views on this one topic. It's just one topic. But it's one way that we can kind of see each other in a little deeper way than just like, well, you have a beard in a black dress, you have a beard in a black dress, let's serve liturgy together. There, we we want to have a deeper understanding of each other, and we hope that this is going to is going to do that. So um, we'll have the Jana is coming to help me do interviews. That's why she's coming to, to visit us uh, uh, from St. Petersburg. We will do the the interviews in these next couple of weeks. Uh, and then she will fly home, and once we figure out where we're going in Russia, then she will join me there, too. Uh, that We're doing that. We have our Vasyas here, great statistician, uh, to minimize confounding variables. We feel like if we both interview everyone, even though she's not a native English speaker and I'm not a native Russian speaker, that that's going to minimize the, some confounding variables. We, if she just interviews people and I just interview people, there could be too many differences in the interview styles. It's just, it's, it's just begging it weakens it. It's already weak anyway. 
with only 20, uh, 40 data points. We would just weaken it considerably more if, if we weren't working on it together. Um, I'm really happy that uh, I received a grant from the, the Fund for Assistance uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, and I thank them very, very much for that. It makes it possible for me to do this research in Russia and for Jana to come here. And um, we're all hoping that it's going to be something that's going to be useful and that it will lead to perhaps more study. Um, so anyway, this is, this is my project. The reason I started doing this, uh, you know, those of you who know me, you know I went to the university, then I went to seminary, and then I went to university again. And um, it's not to put another piece of paper on the wall, and in fact, if you come to my house, you won't find any piece of paper on the wall because I don't know where my diplomas are. I'm sure they're somewhere. Um, but it's, I felt like after 15 years, basically, out from seminary, it was time for me to do something else. I, I, needed, I, I needed to get back into the classroom. And, and also, I'm, if some of you know this, I teach in the pastoral school in our diocese, and we are trying to uh, <coughs> raise the level of our faculty uh, by having the faculty have more terminal degrees. And uh, even though, strictly speaking, you could say this isn't a terminal degree, but uh, pre pretty much it is, I would say, for, for a priest. Um, and this will help there also. So that's my project in a nutshell. Uh, anyone who wants to, you know, read my proposal, you're welcome to. Uh, I have, I think, two very interesting um, readers, uh, advisors. Uh, the first is a professor at, no, by the way, the <coughs> doctoral degree is through Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. It's a Presbyterian uh, seminary. They offer a track for Eastern Orthodox people. And they work with the Antiochian Orthodox Church here in America. Um, it's a really wonderful program. I'm really happy I got the opportunity to do it. It's completely set up for people in ministry. So you go on these kind of week or two week long, very intense, intensive kind of uh, seminars as opposed to semester long classes because they understand you have a parish that you need to take care of. Um, so the, my first reader, my main advisor is uh, John Burgess and he's the professor of um, dogmatic theology there. And he's very interested in Russia. He did a Fulbright in St. Petersburg seven years ago. And this, this year when he went on his, he had his sabbatical again, uh, he was funded by, uh, I think again by Fulbright for, for two years uh, in Russia. So actually he took a leave of absence from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. He's really, really interested in Orthodoxy um, and uh, is a very nice man. Uh, so I think it'll, he'll be in Russia when we go. It'll be very interesting to see him there. I passed out his little uh, memoir from his first trip to Russia when, uh, to a, a bunch of people in the parish. If you don't, if you've never seen it, you know, I'll try to get another copy. It's very interesting to, to, to basically see how someone who comes from a very uh, minimalistic, uh, from an exterior point of view, theological perspective, he's a Protestant, because Presbyterians are very minimalistic. If you've never been in a Presbyterian church, if there's a cross, that would be liberal. Uh, you know, they, they, they use light and, and, and things for their kind of artistic uh, expression, but there's, the, the churches are stark, stark, stark. And to go from that to orthodoxy, which is maximalistic uh, from the artistic point of view, it was very interesting to see. And also the worship, you know, in, in orthodoxy we worship very actively. Um, <clears throat> Presbyterians, not so much. So it was, it was a very interesting memoir to read. Uh, my other... Uh, uh, advisor, um, uh, his name is Roy Robson, or Andranik Robson. He is a um, an old believer from Erie, Pennsylvania, and he's he is a uh, PhD. Uh, he's a professor at one of the small liberal arts colleges in Philadelphia. So um, it's uh, so I have an Orthodox guy and I have a non-Orthodox guy, both very interested in Russia. One old believer, one not. So it's I think a, a nice mix, uh, and I've gotten a lot of really good feedback from them on my project. So that's probably more than I really had intended to say. Uh, I'll, if anyone has any questions about it, I'll be happy to, uh, to entertain those. Now, John. Now what happened uh, with Kazan, if you can talk about it? Nothing. <laughs> we sent all the information, <coughs> asked for the blessing, and nothing. So to me, no answer means look elsewhere. And so we're still trying to 
to work it out because, like I said, I put a lot of eggs in my Kazan basket. Um, but if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, and we'll just the Lord will guide us elsewhere. You know? But I want to stay out of Moscow and St. Petersburg specifically because there is this perception, both in Russia and outside Russia, but especially outside Russia, that Russia is Moscow. And if you're a very diverse person and very open, you would say, well, and P St. Petersburg too. Well, you know, there are a few other uh, places also in Russia. And it seemed, the, the reason I chose Kazan was twofold. One, it's not Moscow and St. Petersburg. Two, it's way more diverse. It's about 40% Muslim and about 40% Orthodox and about 20% of other stuff. Uh, it, there's all kinds, of, all kinds of religions there. Of course, there's Jews there. But there's also like Zoroastrians there, and you know there's uh, Jains there, and there's all because it's 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 in close to Central Asia basically. So you have a lot of really interesting influences. It's diverse, kind of like America. There's no way that there's going to be a place as diverse as America there. But it helps to kind of compare the two dioceses if you say, well, this is a pretty diverse diocese in Russia, and it it is a surrogate more or less of of what an American diocese is. So. Yes, and absolutely we would have to take that into account. But I still I still think it would be useful. Because even though it would be... So I would argue that there's two kinds of tolerance. There's a tolerance that comes from interacting with people, and there's a tolerance of theory that comes from not interacting with Just an abstract tolerance that comes from never interacting with people, but in the abstract saying, well, you know, I should be tolerant of everybody. And so the, the, the reverse is true. Intolerance of not having interacted with anyone and intolerance of interacting with people. So, you know, they have to deal with uh, Muslims and Kazan all the time, so they may have a very poor <coughs> attitude towards them. But we don't just ask about Muslims. We ask about Muslims, we ask about Jews, and we ask about other types of Christians, other non-Orthodox Christians, um, because we want to try to get um, a, a more diverse... If we just focus on Islam, I think that that's... That's kind of like a straw man. That's just a red herring, and I, I, I think we need to be a little bit more diverse uh, than just one uh, faith. Right, so 
that's a very good question, is how do you know exactly what they are thinking or how do you, because there's no test, like we can't test the blood and say, oh, but look, you're, you're a bigot. Right. You, you can't do that. So we have to do kind of the best that we can given the, the, the situation that we're in. So not only do we, will we interview them, but then afterwards we will discuss each person's nonverbal cues and, you know, kind of how they said things and, um, and it's called, you know, field notes in, in the, um, social sciences and, and so we will, we will also use this. So it's not just what they say and we will record it also. Uh, we will record every interview, uh, audio recorded, we're not going to video record it because how could they be, uh, you know, uh, anonymous if we video record. But we will audio record it and um, I don't know how much that audio recording is going to be useful but we're going to do it anyway in case we decide that it will be useful. But uh, we, we feel like the two most important things are the responses that they give and how they give the responses. Like what are their nonverbal cues, what's the body language, what's the, what's the way that they speak. Um, and this is where we run into limits of social science or this kind of quantitative um, study. But it, in a way it might, it might prove to be better than sending out a survey and asking people this. Because when you see it in black and white, when you talk, when you speak, you you say a lot more than what comes out of your mouth. When you just check a box on a on a survey, that's all you have. You just have the check box. Can you just quickly follow up and then let other people see? Um, so can you give us an example of a question that you would ask? Because oh, I, can I, tell I you know exactly. a little bit about how you know, I have so much about this kind of thing. So they, they sometimes they very crucial questions in sort of like this. Yeah, yeah so, so that people are not, you know, suspecting, you know, the directness. Uh, right, so we begin by a few icebreaker sort of questions, which we don't care about that, mm -hmm. uh, that information, and then we get to the actual, to the actual stuff. And so, uh, please explain how you teach your parishioners about the differences between Orthodox Christianity and Catholicism. Okay, that's the first question. Then the follow-up question is, <laughs> after they say that, Please explain how you teach your parishioners about the differences between Orthodox, uh, about uh, Orthodox Christians and Catholics. Yeah. So it's it's different, and so th this hopefully gets kind of to the crux of the of the question, which is, you know, we hope that you can do comparative theology on that level, but now how were you ta talking about the people who hold those beliefs? But it's very open. We're not trying to, you know, to, to ask questions and, and, you know, kind of fool people. We're, we're trying to be very open about we're it. not setting up landmines. No, no. Um, and I thought, well, I just feel like it's better to just be very open about it. Because then it, the, the problem with asking kind of complex questions and seeing, you know, are people giving this kind of answer, this kind of answer, it, it, it makes more problems for the, to me, in the summation, in that when you're trying to, to put everything together, because you know, it, if you've tried to kind of fool people, then how do you write the paper? It just got really complicated, and I think it's just better to be open about it. And when I'm talking with my advisors, I said, yeah, just be very open about it, um, and that way people will, will feel very confident, and they will say what they want to say, uh, and it will give you the best data, the cleanest data that you can have. So, Where is it? Do you think there's any? Uh value to be gained from asking for responses to analogous situations. So for instance, uh, a priest in Moscow made big news by getting murdered in a, clearly, it, it was a, a nationalist thing. I mean, there's lots of them right. from, uh, what is it, three years ago, in any event, there are lots of them where they are, they're clearly in the whole nationalistic uh, question. And I don't mean Russian nationalism so much as I mean basically it's an uh, analogy to racism in the United States. Right. In other words, different, uh, what they call, and because they're almost exclusively related to uh, Islam is Tatar. Tatar is Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, Yivri is Iudizu, and we don't even have that distinction in English, so that sort of goes out to 
and Ruski is Rus Pravaslavnum and Armenian is Armenian. Uh, in the United States, you have um, the race problem. Right. And the, the, uh, what I'm wondering is, would there be some way to gauge attitude by setting up, you know, what did you talk, how did, how did, you, how did your parish react to the murder of so-and-so in 19, or in 2009? Right. And then here, how did the parish react to some other incident that would make a, because these things are so culturally uh, dependent. Right. And very, very different. And yes, right. such, you know, those are admirable to try and find apples to compare with apples. But the cultures are so different. Right. And just have no... It, 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 it's hard to explain to somebody in Russia that in this church we've got Arab, Greek, English, um, and I remember one of the big philanthropists in Russia was building a church Somebody said, oh, this is our friend, uh, he's an American, he said, me events at the Nintendo at the Giago. And an American isn't the international diagnosis. Uh, he was not one of those people, he's not one of those people who's particularly, who we would consider uh, welcoming of diversity. And yet, Perfectly, and it was, it was somewhat of a joke, yeah, a double-edged sword mm -hmm. kind of thing, but to get a, a feel for that, uh, it's just the thought that occurred to me, it's really one of those things that's so hard to compare from the surveys, that if you're doing qualitative as opposed to quantitative, it might make sense to have some kind of you know, question. yeah, you know, we we thought about that, and there are a few kind of, especially the one the sort of uh, icebreaker questions are a little open-ended. But we thought about that. Can you can you use racism in America and compare it to the sort of nationalism in, in, in Russia? Well, in it's absolutely right. But the problem with the reason we decided not to to go down that road. Is because ostensibly these are Russian Orthodox priests, both in Russia and abroad, and it gets kind of it gets kind of mushy because some of the priests will in in America will be Americans, but some will not be. You know, some will be will be will be Russians who are serving here in America. So, it, we actually had a conversation about that and, and whether we could use that kind of a a question. <clears throat> In, in the end, we decided that for the first first slice of this, that we would try to make it as apples to apples and oranges, as to oranges as possible, just because we're not quite sure what that all, how how well that would play out like that. In my mind, it actually made a lot of sense, and I would I was I had an earlier drafts of my proposal had something like that in there, and in the end, basically, we decided together that. We're not quite sure what would happen with that, and, and we may only get one bite at this at this apple. Right. We're talking about apples to apples, and we wanted to try to make it as clean as possible. But it's a it's a very logical and good idea because we, we actually thought about doing that, but in the end decided. Good point, though. Father Gregory, if if uh, if it is the view that Russian priests, Russian clergy, have uh, uh, have these tendencies. Um, how did that view come to be? What gave rise to it? And how is it being perpetuated? Uh, how is it gaining foot? That's a good question. So let's, let me say how I became aware of it. So uh, there is a priest who teaches in St. Petersburg Theological Academies, Father George Mitrofanov. He wrote an article about this in, uh, in a uh, periodical called uh, Ogenyok, right? It's a yok. Ogenyok, it's uh, the flame or the or whatever. It's kind of like Time Magazine or Newsweek News or something like that. And he wrote an article uh, in there called The the Unbaptized Believers. Or the, what was the 
I mean, do you remember the name of the article? It was Ni Nikrishoni Pravoslavni or something like that, or Krishoni Ni Verushi. Anyway, the, the, the baptized unbelievers. And he was, he was bemoaning the fact that, you know, during the Soviet time, yes, there was a lot of persecution, but the people who went to seminary were serious, they were there for a reason, they were focused, they were whatever, and that now, a lot of the people he sees there in seminary are looking for a good career, and they may not really have that much of a faith. And, and that furthermore, they sometimes have very inappropriate attitudes towards, towards others, like racist attitudes. That was really pushing the envelope for him. He, he couldn't do more or say more. He got plenty of you know, pushback from that. Um, but that came out right about the time that I was starting to formulate my ideas about what I do for my project. I knew I wanted to do some kind of comparison between clergy in Russia and abroad, and that just really hit the spot. That, and so the perception is not, I don't know how widespread the perception is, but certainly among some of the senior clergy, it is considered to be a problem. And I think among some of the um, educated classes also, it would be considered a problem. I don't live in Russia, so I can't say exactly. I can only say that there is some sort of perception that this is a problem, um, and that I wanted to see whether or not that's really true. And in fact, we ask people, it's the last question we ask them, there's a perception that, that this, is, this is a problem. Do you believe this is true? And if so, why do you believe this is true? Um, so we'll see how that comes up. But that's that's how we kind of got to that. John? Do you have a notion uh, right now, is it more a rank and file kind of problem, or is it a hierarchy uh, issue as well? If Without any data, I would say that it would be a rank and file sort of problem. I don't believe it's a problem. Only. I think they're, they're very educated, they're very carefully chosen, they're vetted you know, to the nth degree. Um, I, I don't think it's a problem on the hierarchy. Uh, but that, that's a supposition. Uh, I would not think that it would be a problem. Last year. Right. So in the introduction of your lecture, you, just, you mentioned something to the point that uh, they are not in a heavy position vis-a-vis -vis salvation. So is it a conjecture, or is it a fact, or is it from our perspective? So from the Orthodox point of view, we understand that Christ founded the church and that salvation can be found in the church. We don't say that everyone who's outside the church is condemned, but we don't understand how salvation works for them. And that it certainly must be harder to, to be saved when you're not in the church that Christ founded than if you are in the church that Christ founded. And so that's why the Orthodox Church has always been a church of mission, of going out and bringing people into the church. We, we don't know that. <coughs> Everything that happens to people outside the church, but certainly we'd rather have them in a position where the, where they're in the church that Christ founded. So yeah, we 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 it's God who decides what happens to both people inside and outside the church. But at least inside, we understand kind of what the process is and and how what's the right way to go, what's the right path, um, and that sort of unknowing or unclear question about people outside the church is something that we want to try to resolve by bringing them to us. Does that help? Yep. Good. Good. Any other questions about that? John. So if, if it's God who decides who's saved and who's not, and uh, so if the church decides that you know so-and-so and all these people are going to be saints, is it possible that maybe one of those saints has somehow not been saved, and then what happens when we pray to that saint? And just, is so that, that, that's a good question, question actually. Um, <clears throat> you know, during the synodal period of the church, after Peter the Great, uh, glorifications were reduced significantly. Uh, and in fact, uh, at one at one point, uh, Saint Anna Kashina was glorified, then unglorified, and re-glorified again. They were very, 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 very careful about who they, they would glorify. And I'm not saying that now the, the Synod is not careful, but it was it was so, so, so it was too, too, with, with the civilian sort of overseeing the synod, there was just too much pressure on the, on the church about that. So I think that the church is pretty careful about who gets glorified and who doesn't. Um, it's something that happens from the bottom up as a rule. I can tell you about this glorification of St. John of San Francisco. 
the bishops more or less, they, they didn't argue the fact that he was a saint, but they just didn't feel like it was time. You know, usually you wait a couple generations till everybody who knew the person is dead, and then that's done. But the, the cry from the believers was so strong that there was just no way that, that they, could, they could hold that back anymore. Um, and, and so he, he was glorified. Even one of the bishops didn't, didn't serve at the, at the liturgy, one of the bishops who knew him, you know, decided not to serve the, the liturgy at the glorification. It was just, it was soon, but it was from, it was from the way that it should be because of all of the miracles that came from, from St. John and the people's great veneration of him. And I think in general that's been the practice in the Russian church. The Russian church has been pretty careful about who gets glorified and who doesn't. Of course now a lot of new martyrs are, are glorified, but that's, that's a different process. That's more of a collecting <coughs> evidence sort of thing. If you can show that someone was killed for their faith, they're a martyr, that's it. There's actually not even a glorification service for martyrs. Um, the church has instituted one, but in the early church there wasn't. If you were killed for your faith and it was clear, that was it. You're a martyr and then there's no there's no more discussion about it. Um, all the other rank, ranks of saints, there's a process and a, an actual glorification service. So, uh, you know, long story short, I think pretty much the, the church is uh, pretty careful about who, who gets glorified and who doesn't. There's a high bar. Here. Well, what about some of the... Um Princes that were glorified, they, they didn't, like, they weren't like monks or wonder workers. They, they just, I don't know, they protected Russia from some other. So, in the ranks of the saints, there's every possible person from the lowliest peasant to the greatest king to the monk to the nun to the, the regular believer to everybody. And sanctity is not limited to one sort of rank of, of society. Of course, you find a lot of sanctity in, in monasticism, but you find a lot of sanctity in, in people who are living in the world too, like St. Senia. So I think that the, the, the bottom line is that if people, the way to, to the kingdom of heaven is to, as best as possible, to do the duty that God has given you. And if your duty is to be a prince, then be the best prince you can be in an orthodox point of view, and you'll attain the heavenly kingdom. If you're, if what, if the job that God has given you is to dig ditches, then dig the best ditches that you can dig from an orthodox point of view, be the best person you can be, and you will attain the heavenly kingdom. So it's, what you do is not so much as how you, important as how you do it. Do you do it as a, as a, as a true orthodox Christian? And if so, then that's how they attain the heavenly kingdom. Okay. Good question. Okay. If people want to ask questions about Islam, you can ask questions about Islam. I took a whole, took me about a year and a half to, to take a class about Islam. It was a really long class. I learned a lot. It was very interesting. Um, and one of the hardest classes I ever took. The two hardest classes I ever took was a freshman uh, math class I took at the University of Michigan and the Islam class. They were both uh, self Paced studies. I had to work closely with the professor in the Islam class, but he refused, he did not give me a timeline. He's like, well, as long as we're alive, we'll you know, we'll work on this. So um, it was very hard. And I had, it was very hard to push myself. When I have a deadline, no problem. But he was just like, well, send it to me when you're done. And uh, and I finally did. But it was it was very difficult. So, Father Gregory, can you uh, say something about the um, significance of certain crosses that adorn our churches? Um, the the one that I have in mind has the the crescent moon. Oh yeah, with the cross driven down. So to it. so sometimes you in the Russian church. I've never seen one in the, in the Greek church, which is funny because the Greeks had a lot more issues with Islam than the Russians did. But in any case, um, the in some <laughs> Russian churches you see the bottom. Uh, you know, it's a three bar cross, but the bottom is the crescent moon uh, of Islam, and it's always if you see it like on a the Saudi flag or something, it's kind of at a, an angle. Right, so it takes up, you know, a, a half. But in the in the in the cross, it's always upside down. Um, anyway, that that just shows the that signifies uh, victory over over Islam. Uh, and of course, you know, in in Russia, there's been uh, 
interaction with Islam, and of course the most famous would be the uh, the, the Tartars who came in off the Asian steppe. At the time, they were pagans, but eventually they uh, accepted Islam. Mm -hmm. But you see them abroad, actually, sometimes. I've seen I've seen new churches built like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, do you want my opinion on whether we should use that kind of a cross? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it goes back to what you were saying. It's we're, you're dealing with how do how do Orthodox how do orth, how do Orthodox people, you know, broaden it, broaden its scope? How do right. Orthodox people feel about people? Right. Because we're asking the question, how do we feel about people? Right. Not right. how do we feel about a system of belief or a system right. of trust. I mean, we have legitimate, we have legitimate uh, uh, issues with Islam. But should we therefore not like Muslim people? I mean, I wouldn't put that kind of a cross on my church if I was asked. And, and the only reason is because like, if someone is, is coming who is a Muslim and they're kind of interested in Christianity, um, I mean, is the first thing you want them to see that, you know, like we're rubbing their face in the dirt. Right. You know, that to me, that just drives them back and says, okay, you know, like you're going to think bad things about me. I'm not coming here. But that's me. Like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm probably too soft of a person. But that, that's, that's my impression. I, I personally wouldn't. But I, I see them occasionally, and that's, that's what the significance of them is. I don't think it's terrible if people want to use them, but I, I wouldn't. Well, somebody told me that you could also, if you don't like that interpretation for yourself, just think of it as like a boat and then the sail is the cross and like the mast. Yeah, and but that's not what it means. Yeah. But if you want to think about it that way. <laughs> Authorial <laughs> intent. Okay. And all that. Uh, Gregory, do yes. I think that would be one of the questions you want to include in your questionnaire, how they interpret this. Because w when I was talking about that this is a symbol of the victory, the victory was not over the religion. The victory was over this invasion, uh, which was done by the religious so Represented symbolically by the religious symbol, right? Yeah, but, you know, right now, maybe it's interesting how they interpret this, right? That's a good question. We, that, that may be something that would be good to, to ask. That, that may elicit some really interesting answers. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting thing. I will talk with uh, Sean about that when she arrives on Friday. Can you tell us about what you worried about Islam in five minutes? <laughs> five minutes or less? Well, okay, so the first thing that you have to know about me is um, I, my undergraduate degree was in history, and I think about everything historically. So I, I, it, you can't, I don't think you can understand Islam without understanding the history of Islam. You know, I don't, you, you don't, you, you can't just understand Orthodox Christianity without understanding, you know, the history of Orthodox Christianity. At least I can't. Others may be able to, but I can't. And so, uh, I found it very interesting to learn about Muhammad and, and uh, how the Quran was, was written, uh, which was not at the time of Muhammad, by the way. Most people think it was, but it was. Uh, the, the Quran it means recitation. And so it was recited to him, um, and later it was written down, and it was spread only by word of mouth, so later it was written down. Um, it was during the second caliphate, I think. Umar, I can't remember that. That's, I probably should know that. Uh, but anyway, it was written down uh, after, after Muhammad died. Uh, so, in any case, that to me is very interesting. And what were the influences? Like, there's a lot of Christianity in, in the Quran. But it's a very sort of um, strange Christianity for us as Orthodox Christians. Um, that part of the world did not have a strong Orthodox influence. There were Christians there. Uh, they're mostly Jacobite Christians, so Monophysite Christians, and, and it was a, a very different kind of faith. And plus, Muhammad was kind of getting pieces and chunks of it. Um, and so his 
he has very interesting things about Christianity in, in the Quran, like about this miracle of Christ with these clay doves and he makes them alive. And, I mean, stuff that we've, we've never heard of. Um, but at the same time, uh, Christ is considered to have been, uh, the, the, uh, was born of a virgin. I mean, there's all kinds of, like pieces of Christianity, but not all of Christianity in there. Um, and because the Quran is like the end all and be all for Muslims, if it's in there, that means that's true. And if, and if you have a discussion with a Muslim, they may start talking about clay birds and stuff like that, and they'll be like, what? And, and they say, well, you know it's in the Quran, so that must be true. So it, it has a very interesting dynamic, especially in the Middle East. We don't really feel that here, but um, because there's going to be a lot more conversations there. But, you know, we do have the largest uh, Muslim population outside the Middle East, not far from us in, in Dearborn. So I think that was another reason why I wanted to study more about Islam, because I thought it would be useful for us here. Um, you know, there's a lot of Muslim people who live in Washtenaw County also, and it's, I think, important for us to know how to have conversations with them. So that's why I wanted to, to, to study Islam. Um, it's basically, you know, Christianity is 2,000 years, Islam is 1,400 years. It's really hard to, you know, get that into five minutes. Uh, but basically, there are two major groups of, of uh, Muslims. There are Sunnis and Shias. Um, Shias, we would identify a little bit more with. They have sort of, sort of saints, kind of, and they, they're. Uh, I, I think of Sunnis as Protestants. They're very minimalistic, very, very simple, uh, and Shias are. It's more complicated, and like I said, they have saints and kind of holy people. They have a series of imams, and they, they have a concept of uh, an apocalypse, like we believe that, that Christ will come again at the, at the end of the world. They believe that it, uh, one of the imams will come again at the end of the world. So um, I think that one of the problems we have in America is we don't understand the differences between Sh Shia and Sunni Islam at all. Um, we, if you look at what's happening in Syria, completely misunderstood by the people in the West. The people in power are Shia. The people who are rising up are Sunni. This is an old story. It's been happening for a thousand years. You know, it's not, but either the people don't understand it or it's not being portrayed that way. I'm not saying it's good that people are dying, not at all. But this is not, like, this is, a, this is an old story. This is not something new. These people have been doing this to each other, you know, since the Shia and Sunni split. So, um... Are you implying that the popular press in America might actually not have the story completely straight? Far be it from me to imply that. But uh, people are not getting the whole truth and nothing but the truth from our faithful. The thing about this one, though, is I can't tell if it's just like they don't understand or if it's on purpose. I don't know. But in any case, that's that's what's happening there. You know, it's and it's a there is a real division between them. But at the same time, there they are. All Muslims, and they all will go to Mecca together, and you know they will there. They will just sort of pretend that there are no differences, but when they go home, there there are differences. Um, the Shia mostly are in Iran, Iraq. Some there's a little swath across uh, into Syria uh, and up into Central Asia also. Uh, and the Sunni are are uh, farther west and through Africa and Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country, by the way. Most people think Saudi Arabia or something, but you know Saudi Arabia doesn't have many people. It's not about oil, but not many people. <laughs> Indonesia is the, the largest Muslim country. There's about 200 million people there. Everyone in Turkey is mostly Sunni. They're Sunni. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. Shia in the north. Yes, in the in the in the, the east, mm -hmm. closer to the Iran. East. Most of the most of the Muslims uh, that we would come in contact with are, are Sunni. There are Shia Muslims here. And there's, Shia, there's a Shia mosque in Dearborn, uh, but most of the Muslims that we will come into contact with are, are Sunni. What is, uh, some of the contributing factors to the golden age of Islamic science? I guess in the you know, the tenth, the eleventh century. Well, I guess by the time they occupied most of Iberia and all of North Africa, what what are the things that are considered the major contributing factors to that um, growth of their culture and science? And well, it, 
depends on who you read. Because some people would say the main contributing factor to the golden age of Islam were the people that they took over and that they subjected to themselves. Um, one of the things that... That's is, true about any civilization. Yeah, especially if it's like you know nomads or sort of a war. Right. I mean, they, these people they were they were nomads more or less. Um, so I, I'm sure there are authors that would argue with this, but we have to understand Islam means subjection, right? Submission. Submission. Sorry, submission. Uh, and you you had to submit, uh, or or there were consequences. So you had a choice. Here are the here are the here is the Islam, Muslim army outside your city. You have two choices. If you're a Christian or a Jew, you can keep your religion, but you have to pay a high tax. Uh, and it just kind of depended on. Sometimes you would officially you had to pay a high tax. You were allowed to keep your your faith. You would have had to dress in a special way to identify yourself as as a person who was not a Muslim. If you're not a person of the book. Your, your, your other choices are a little bit more limited. You can either be killed or become a Muslim. If you're a pagan. Yeah, if you're a pagan. The, the, so first it was Jews and, and Christians who were numbered among this, this group. But as, it, as Islam went farther east, then others were also, like Zoroastrians were, were uh, numbered among that group. I think there might be more. But anyway, it's kind of, uh, actually in, in, uh, in India even, uh, Hindus are allowed to remain Hindus, but you have to pay the tax, and you have to dress a special way. To, it, not always, but usually you would have to dress a special way um, to identify yourself as not a Muslim. Uh, Non-Muslims cannot um, give evidence in court against Muslims. Um, any evidence that a Muslim gives against a non-Muslim is considered to be true because a non-Muslim can't give any truthful evidence. So there's all kinds of things in there, you know. Um, it, there's all kinds of things about Islam that make it difficult to not be a Muslim. It helped grow Islam because it was very difficult for people to not be a Muslim when they were a part of the uh, part of the the empire of uh, of Islam. And so, to get back to Nathan's questions, question, there are several authors who say the reason that Islam flourished is because of the people that they took over. Um, and that those people provided a, a lot of education and administrative know-how and so on and so forth to the empire. That makes sense to me. I mean, I, I, I think that that's probably pretty much right. But it's probably more complex than that. Um, there were just a lot of resources that were coming into the, into the, uh, into the caliphate at that time. There were people had the opportunity to be educated where they didn't have, where they were, you know, before they were just kind of nomads and farming and sort of whatever. Now there was a class system and they had resources that would allow them to be able to be educated and once you start educating one generation it just sort of builds. So I think it's a complex question but certainly part of it had to do with they had the opportunity to pursue that education because they had people who could administer their their empire for them, who they more or less trusted to do that, um, who would bring in the resources, and therefore the upper classes had the opportunity to become educated, and there was a flourishing of culture and medicine and all sorts of uh, mathematics and all sorts of things uh, at that time. John, um, the way I I've always understood it, um, the submission uh, in Islam is not necessarily submission to the, the caliph's army, it's submission to God. No, that's right. It's right. But it means to be Muslim. It, it does. You have to submit yourself to God. That's that's absolutely right. But it there are consequences to not uh, doing this, um, especially for those who are not Muslim. So I think, again, I'm talking about a historical sort of path, the way that things went. That doesn't happen today, you know. Um, but at the same time, it is not easy to be a Christian in a, in a Muslim uh, country, and in some Muslim countries, it's not legal to be a Christian. Um, but that, that's the minority. <coughs> Other questions? It's getting late, and we can probably wrap up. I think that the 
questions about Islam. I thought about, well, I'll prepare something and give it a talk, but and we, maybe we can do that another time, because I think that it's important for us as a parish to learn more about our, our Muslim neighbors. Um, but I also wanted to kind of just get your feel, what your questions were about Islam to help me also to guide me in, in that next project. So if you have other questions, uh, please feel free to ask me uh, after the talk or anytime. Thank you, everyone.